This is our town. Fairmont, Minnesota, USA. Yes, this is our town. Situated on five of the state's beautiful lakes, it is rich in farmland and a center of industry. Today, our town operates as a city of the fourth class. It's grown to a census figure of 8,500 with over 10,000 people in the area of Greater Fairmont. Our town is the county seat of Martin County, one of the richest agricultural centers in this area. The city's trade district extends approximately 30 miles out in all directions. Not only business, but industry and farm trade as well flourish here in Fairmont. The Martin County Courthouse was constructed in 1906 on the site of Fort Fairmont, which was built during the Sioux Indian Uprising of 1862. The county officers and the judge of the district court have offices here. In the span of almost a hundred years since the earliest beginnings of this area, our town has prospered and grown into a thriving community. Fairmont operates under the mayor and council form of government. An alderman represents each of the city's various wards, in addition to an alderman at large, who is chosen at the biennial elections. The mayor appoints, subject to the approval of the council, committees on finance, library, and also various others. All of these men work together, along with the citizens of Fairmont, to keep our town a clean and well-managed city. The Volunteer Fire Squad is one of our town's most efficient departments. Complete in every way, it has two pumpers, a first aid ambulance, a boat for water rescue work, a hook and ladder, and a farm truck, which is owned by the farmers and operated for them by the town. Each farmer is assessed for fire protection on the basis of his farm size, with country calls paid for by the farmer's insurance company. The department was first organized in the 1880s and today consists of 25 members. Membership in a volunteer company such as this is really quite an honor. The traditions are strong and most of the men have been with the department for years. A pension goes into effect for each man as he reaches 50. George Cavers is the chief of police in our town. Chief Cavers has been with the department here for 17 years and has been in his present position for three. A graduate of the FBI National Police Academy in Washington, he has had extensive training, and this, coupled with years of experience, make Chief Cavers an outstanding servant of the law. He is a fine example of the alert, informed, and efficient police who make our town a good and safe place in which to live. Yes, both the men and the equipment are of a high caliber. Radio-controlled cars in the hands of well-trained and competent men like these safeguard our town. An important part of the police department's activities is a visit to their pistol range. Every week they shoot here and, in addition, attend other pistol matches throughout the state. In fact, our department even has a specially trained match team. This team is made up of four men who get the highest score in these practice matches here. And the competition is really tough. They are all excellent marksmen. As a matter of fact, the department does an excellent job in all of its various functions. In 1947, Fairmont was the winner of the Governor's Trophy in the Minnesota Safety Contest. In 1953, our town tied with two others in the state. This award is given for the best public safety work during the year. Besides handling traffic control and the usual policing procedures, the Chief's Office is always open for advice and information, not to just the people of our town, but to those persons traveling through the state. Traffic and highway control is one of the major concerns of a town like ours. The intersections of highways 15 and 16 at the edge of town have a constant flow of cars and trucks entering, leaving, or passing through Fairmont. One of the ways a town can minimize its traffic problems and prepare for an ever-growing number of cars is to make certain that drivers and future drivers are well trained in both the operation of their vehicles and in the understanding and applying of the rules of the road or traffic laws. Around 170 students at the Fairmont High School 
are taking driver training courses under the sponsorship of the school district. The students become eligible to take this course when they reach 15 and qualify for a learner's permit. Well trained even before getting into a car, they receive 30 hours of classroom work before actually going on the road. The four new cars which are used in the course are loaned to the school by local dealers, each equipped with dual controls. Qualified instructors teach the youngsters to become safe, sane, and confident drivers. Adults may, and many of them have, join the course to better their own driving habits. The modern motorized age has created many new problems, but in organizing and carrying out a driver training program like this, our town proves that it's kept pace, and done so admirably. Most certainly, this fine program deserves some of the credit for Fairmont's outstanding safety record. The school system in our town is an excellent one with a full program to round out the lives of our young people. Central High, in addition to offering driver training instruction, makes possible to students courses in music, arts, domestic science, and many more. William Budd School stands as a modern symbol of our town's great progress in the field of better education for all. There are three elementary schools, each with playgrounds providing ample space for training and recreation. Located just a little outside our town is the Martin County Highway Department. They work in close cooperation with the State Highway Department to keep the paved all-weather roads that lead in all directions from our town open and in good condition. The operations involved range all the way from basic paving and resurfacing work to spraying the roadsides with 2,4-D and other chemicals to kill noxious weeds. Our town owns its electric light and power plant, its waterworks and public heating plant. A separate commission selected by the mayor and approved by the council has charge of our town's utilities. Many of Fairmont's citizens know the commission only by the fine work it provides. This service, combined with a record of improvements, adds up to a long list that's worthy of mention. The Fairmont plant produces more current than any other city in Minnesota, with the exception of Austin and Rochester. From 1930 to 1945, rate reductions for power, commercial light, water, residential light, and steam heat took place. In 1949, greatly increased costs forced a 10% increase in all rates, the only one since 1930. It's truly a long record of service and economy for the people of our town. But there were, in addition, other improvements. In the year 1890, our town was entirely lighted by kerosene. Early the next year, a small electric light plant was started in a shed, which stood about where the city hall is now. Beside the constant demands of Fairmont's modern industries for power, the homes of our town require a tremendous power production for lights, refrigerators, electric shavers, radios, television sets, and many other home appliances. It's this electric power that makes possible so much of the comfort and convenience of our modern everyday living. At the same time that power facilities have grown, plant capacity today is 12,000 kilowatts. The rates have remained relatively low. For example, 1,500 kilowatt hours of commercial light cost only $38.87. For many years, it has been the plan of the Commission to not only provide the best possible service to the people of our town at rates below most of our neighboring cities, but also to transfer to the City Council money in lieu of taxes when available and not putting into jeopardy services and rates. The entire retail district of our town is now heated by steam, furnished by the Municipal Light and Power Station. But progress continues as these men install a new city heat main. The same heat from the plant's boilers, which turn the turbines to generate electric power, is piped out to be used for heating purposes. The Power and Light Commission also operates the waterworks. Pure, softened water is furnished to our town under pressure from this plant. The city obtains its water from a chain of five shallow lakes. The watershed consists of rich agricultural lands on which commercial fertilizer is used. 
As a result of this, organically rich drainage, algae, furnishes abundantly in the lake. The department treats the lakes during the summer with copper sulfate to destroy these organisms, which would most certainly cause an objectionable taste in the water. Our plant uses only the most modern methods of water softening. Actually, the hardness of the water is reduced to about five grains per gallon. Chemist for the Water and Light Commission, Mr. Colt, is making just one of the many water hardness tests. All of these things are just some indication of the advantages of living in our town. The town, as well as the suburbs, offer ideal living conditions. Many fine, comfortable homes are for rent or can be purchased. New homes are constantly being constructed with a rate of building on the average of 100 units a year. One of the most important functions of the city engineering department is that of keeping Fairmont a beautiful town, and they do it well. The Fairmont Building and Loan Association is intimately connected with this building program. The association, which was organized over 60 years ago, has as its purpose two main ideas, to provide a place for thrifty persons to save their money and to get a fair return in the form of dividends. Also, to provide a place for those persons who wish to borrow money with which to either buy or build homes. Mr. and Mrs. Edwin Hyde talk over a possible home loan with the secretary and managing officer of the association, Martin Shamber. Mr. Hyde is well known since his father has been a member of the association for many years and his grandfather was an early member of the board of directors. Informality and the personal touch are the keynotes on which the Building and Loan Association operates. The people they serve are not only good customers, but good friends as well. The Hydes and Mr. Chamber have decided to take a look at some of the housing the association has helped to construct. The association has over 800 home loans with the properties located in Martin County. Loans are made not only in our town, but also in the surrounding area of the county. The association has wholeheartedly supported the GI loan program and has made over well over 300 of these loans on homes in and around us. Every effort possible is made to make sure that each home loan fits the borrower's ability to pay. It's actually tailor-made service, a good example of the association's personal touch. Along with the rapid growth that has come, the past years have seen intensified efforts to safeguard the savings of the association's members. In 1952, 32% of the earnings were allocated to reserves. There are 3,500 savers and stockholders who are proud members of the association. The hearty vigor of our town is very largely reflected in our banks. The Fairmont National Bank, which began in 1907, on a very small scale, has grown to be Martin County's largest bank, employing at this time 19 people. Mr. J.F. Heckel, the president of our Fairmont National Bank, and W.H. Norman, the cashier, have both been with the bank since 1918. In Mr. Heckel's office, they are talking things over with our fine mayor, K.M. Brown. The other officers of the bank include Mr. Ray L. Heckel, vice president, and A.E. Fillmore. John H. Heckel and Elsie Lee. Modern banking procedure today is extremely precise and efficient in view of the large amount of business that's carried on here every day. In the early days, the only banking equipment used was an adding machine, a far cry from the methods that are employed today. In order to ensure the utmost safety, pictures are taken of all out-of-town checks for a permanent record. This way, a description of lost checks can always be had. All of the checks and deposits made in the bank are run through a proof machine. In case of a mistake in arithmetic, the machines become automatically locked until the correction is made. These modern banking methods, along with an alert and interested management, have done their part in developing business and economic prosperity. Our bank is kept pace with, and most certainly, Fairmont's growth. The largest manufacturer in our town is Fairmont Railway Motors Incorporated. It had its beginning shortly after the turn of the century as a small machine shop, first producing engines. 
In 1909, Fairmont engines were first applied to railway hand line and production of complete motor cars and was producing its own models in the early 1920s. In this same period, the foundry began the manufacture of some maintenance of way work equipment, such as weed burners, weed mowers, and diskers. As business increased, the plant grew accordingly until today when the company owns 12 acres of ground and has approximately 250,000 square feet of floor space. Products have increased too and include now 17 different models of motor cars. Then models of push cars and 30 separate units of work equipment. These products are sold to practically every railroad in the United States and Canada in addition to being exported to Mexico, Central and South America, Africa, Asia and to parts of Europe. At present, the company employs around 400 people. It maintains district offices in four other cities, with the central office, of course, in our town. In 1913, the city of Duluth had offered the company an attractive proposition to move the big factory and central office to that town. When the news of this offer became known in Fairmont, a citizens' committee was organized and financial assistance was pledged to the company in order to persuade the officers and directors to remain in Fairmont and continue their work. The company did remain, and its growth has provided employment and livelihood for many of the people of town since that time. Man and machines work together here, work together to create the products basic to the transportation system and economic strength of this country. The operations within the plant are extremely varied and complex, but all highly organized and efficient. The foundry pours castings ranging all the way from giant pieces weighing 600 pounds to some of only a fraction of an ounce. The many machines turn and cut parts, drill, bore and shape. Each machine, each man has a part in the creating of the final product. The welder, symbol of modern industrial production, does his all important part in the fabricating of components for equipment. Then the finished product itself begins to take shape. A single cylinder two cycle engine is being assembled. After this is completed, the engines are test run for several hours to check for any faults. Then they are again thoroughly inspected and checked before being painted and delivered to final car assemblies. The equipment is painted in this spray booth. Exhaust fans draw the paint mist away from the operator. The motor car sub-assemblies, chassis, housing, deck and engine are delivered here for forming the final completed car. After assembly, they are again tested under power in a soundproof booth. Before new designs are adopted, the experimental cars are run on the test track. During this test, they run attended. Weights and sandbags are used to load the car to its rated capacity. The track is purposely made extra rough to make the test severe. Any car that survives the grueling 10,000 mile run is known to be safe for normal operation. Safety and performance are bywords at the plant. This unit employs hydraulic power to pull rail spikes. Unusual in design and appearance, its ease of handling is an outstanding feature. This unit makes an originally tough, dirty job comparatively easy. Various work tools such as discs, ballast boxes, bladers and the center plow can be mounted at the ballast maintenance car for working track ballast. The tool frames are operated by hydraulic power. At a railroad crossing near our plant, we see another piece of railway motors equipment. Guide wheels position this highway motor car on the track and are easily raised for transfer to road operation. The high rail can take to the road and travel around obstructions in the oncoming track and then later return to the track and continue on. This piece of fine equipment is just another example of the ingenuity and excellent workmanship that have made Fairmont Railway Motors products so valuable and famous throughout the entire world. All these things, vigorous industry, thriving business, a progressive alert leadership, good housing, excellent schools and opportunities for recreation, make our town a fine place for the young to grow up. From these normal and healthy boys will come the future leaders of our community. 
Both young and old enjoy the many and varied opportunities for relaxation and fun. After the day's work is over, the people of our town come out to watch their team, the Fairmont Martins, play night ball in competition with other towns in the regional league. The Martins play a full schedule in the Western Minnesota League with night home games played at Martin Park. It's always fun to come out and have a hot dog, outguess the managers, boo the umpires, and root the home team through to another victory. And that's what the people of our town do. They work and work hard, but they also like to relax. And Fairmont offers an interesting and wide variety of recreational facilities to not only its citizens, but also to visitors. There are five public parks for swimming, old-fashioned picnics, and public or private gatherings. In addition, our town employs a recreation leader to carry out a complete program for both children and adults. The Board of Education adds to our all-round setup by maintaining concrete tennis courts, which are always available to the public. The many beautiful lakes adjacent to our town make possible boating, good fishing, and well-equipped swimming beaches. A striking golf course with its bent green grass and modern clubhouse are other items in the long list. During the fall season, Fairmont is the center for excellent pheasant and duck shooting. A large game reserve is maintained by the Martin County Conservation Club for the purpose of furnishing abundant breeding grounds for wildlife and geese. Yes, the baseball fans of our town really turn out for a game, but it isn't this fact that is of major importance. Almost everyone likes a good baseball game, but another reason for the citizens' interest in sports and all recreational activities is that they like to play and relax together as well as work together. That's the spirit of our town, the spirit of being united as one, a group working toward one goal, the betterment of themselves, their families, and community. This is the spirit that makes our town so successful. Sure, the folks have fun at baseball games, but they can have both fun and enjoyment anywhere as long as they're together. It's Sunday afternoon in the park. This is where the children of our town grow up, in a friendly, relaxed atmosphere. A happy and sincere childhood in a pleasant, balanced community is the best guarantee of our town's future. These Minnesota children will take their places in our community knowing what this childhood is meant, and thus will carry it on to their children. This is the kind of education that cannot be learned from any textbook, but simply from living a normal and healthy life in the out of doors. Here is one of our parks. Friends can meet not just these young people, but persons of all ages, from grandson to granddad. On the nearby lakes, summer motor and sailboats are major sports. It's not unusual to see motorboats ply between Sisseton and Bud and Hall Lakes through well kept channels. One of the first ways the children of our town begin to participate in community affairs is through membership in the municipal band. The band is made up of high school students and adults from Fairmont. Eight concerts are scheduled during the summer in Sylvania Park on the shores of beautiful Lake Sisseton. The band members practice hard all winter and the concerts are always a much looked forward to event. Composed of 35 adults and about 40 high school members, our band is in its third year. Both adults and students of our town use the Fairmont Public Library, which has an annual circulation of some 75,000 books. The churches of our town stand in testimony to the spiritual life of Fairmont. Few citizens of its class have so many fine churches. Yes, this is a town young, vigorous, and alert. The faith of the early pioneers who, but three generations ago, selected this as a home has been more than justified. And so ends the first part of our story. You've seen but only half of the facets of life and the wonderful people of Fairmont. We cordially invite you and your entire family to visit again with us next week 
for part two of Our Town, Fairmont, Minnesota, USA. This is our town, Fairmont, Minnesota, USA. Yes, this is our town, the Martin County seat, a town strong in expanding industry, a hub of the rich agricultural district, clean, well-kept. Ours is a good town. Located 11 miles from the Iowa line on US Highway 16, the State Highway 15, our town is also a center for vacationists coming from all across the country. Our location on the chain of beautiful lakes makes it a natural vacation spot with all types of varied recreational activity. Each year, visitors and prospective new settlers come to our town by car, bus, and railroad. Since the year 1878, when the railroad first came to Fairmont, it has enjoyed a steady and prosperous growth. In fact, Every census for the past 30 years has shown about a 20% increase in population. The trains bring these visitors to our town of homes, schools, factories, business, and perhaps most important, churches. A town economically sound. Yes, Fairmont faces a bright future. Ample water, cheap and abundant power, and ever-growing industrial and agricultural fields all point the way to this. Ours is a vigorous and growing community. Fairmont and its five suburbs offer ideal living conditions. Many beautiful and lovely homes are for sale or rent, with construction on an ever-increasing scale. Our town is not content to stand by with what it already has, but is constantly building, building for the future. Yes, many people come to our town during the year, by bus as well as train. Let's go into the heart of our town, and see what makes it the outstanding community it is. There are over 350 shopping places from which the consumer may draw on large and complete stocks. Fairmont has become, through the years, South Minnesota's trade center. Many imposing public buildings house the various groups, institutions, and civic departments which contribute so very much to the scope, both civic and cultural, of our town's affairs. All of them have certain duties to perform, such as Fairmont's own post office. Our town's newspaper, the Daily Sentinel, is probably one of the oldest continuous institutions in or around this area. It had its beginning back in 1874, and since that time, there have been only four different publishers. The first was the late Frank A. Day, one of the most colorful figures in pioneer Minnesota journalism. The paper today, has more than 7,000 subscribers in the Fairmont area. The present publisher is Walter K. Mickelson, who assumed his duties in January of this year. The Daily Sentinel's editor is now Claude N. Swanson. Now both these men have long and experienced newspaper backgrounds. They are carrying on the long history and high prestige for which the paper has always been respected. Besides providing excellent coverage of local news, our paper also carries the Associated Press Wire, which brings to the people of Fairmont national and international news. Fairmont's modern hospitals afford our citizens the latest in advanced medical care and hospitalization facilities. This hospital began in 1928, and in 1940 became a community hospital. The staff of 60 people consist of doctors, nurses, practical nurses, aides and technicians, all trained to bring the people of our town the best in medical care and treatment. Meticulous operating rooms like this, plus the most modern equipment and procedure, make this, most certainly, one of the outstanding hospitals in this area. Last year, 650 new citizens came to Fairmont, and this year, well, you can see for yourself. 
the youth of our town grow up strong, alert, and interested in the world around them, as well as their own town. Wonderful recreational facilities make growing up in Fairmont a wonderful and exciting time for our young people. These girls are swimming at Interlochen Park, just south of the city between Hall and Amber's Lakes. Besides this fine beach, there are kiddie rides, a roller skating rink, dancing pavilion, and many other spots to offer appeal, not just to the youngsters alone, but to the older folks as well. Beautiful and spacious picnic grounds here at the park are the site of many happy family and group outings. Small wonder it is, then, that this is such a popular place in the spring and the summer. But the youth of Fairmont have other interests besides having just all-out good times. Many of them serve in the Future Farmers of America, a program of the Agricultural Department of the high school. This way, the youth of our town are integrated with the community. James App was the state winner of the FAA public speaking contest held at the University Farm. All of the Future Farmer members have their own special interests and by means of this organization are able to pursue them. The FAA also develops interests and skill. It's a wonderful organization for the young people of Fairmont, and the citizens of our town are solidly behind it. Mr. Tushetter, head of the FAA in this area, tells Jim about how judging is done. And you can bet that Jim's interested, too. A slender neck, dished face, and wide... An alert, bright eye indicates the health and vigorous condition of the animal and its disposition. It takes years of experience to do this judging correctly. Mr. Tashetter tells Jim how the Guernsey was reserve champion at the Martin County 1952 FAA show. Her two-year-old production record was 320 pounds of butterfat. Jim listens and learns. And he'll learn about many other things, such as modern farming programs from the FAA, an outstanding organization for the young people of our town. Farming is an all-important part of the economy of Fairmont, Minnesota. The Fairmont Canning Company, a locally owned institution, cans and freezes vegetables. In fact, they are the largest processor of frozen vegetables in the Midwest. Here we see the first step in the long and complicated process of the canning procedure. Peas which have been planted in the early spring are harvested for processing. The mowers you saw cut seven-foot swaths through the pea fields, and then the loading machines lift the windrows of pea vines into the trucks, which will then carry them to the vining stations. In the peak season, crews like this work day and night. At the vining stations, the peas are removed from the pods. If this were done by hand, it would take endless days of needed manpower. However, the machines at the binaries gently break open the pods and allow the peas to separate. This automatic type of production cuts the time way down. The peas are then gathered into boxes to be sent onto the cannery. Each year, a number of Bahaman workers help with the harvest and pitch the peas into the viners. The vines with the peas removed are stacked with the aid of an ingenious tractor fork arrangement for later feeding to livestock. This is really a large-scale operation. The Fairmont Canning Company began operation in 1919 and in 1926 began experimenting with frozen vegetables. After the peas are removed from the pod, they are rushed in boxes to the plant. Here, a sample is taken to determine the exact quality before the peas are dumped into the processing line. Every attempt possible is made to pick and harvest the peas when they are at their peak of perfection. The boxes are dumped into elevator buckets, which take them to the cleaner. Here, leaves, pieces of pod, and clinging dirt are removed by water. An important step in the processing is the controlling of quality. And for this, the tenderometer is used. The tenderometer is a machine developed to determine the tenderness and the quality of the peas. It is literally what you might call a bite test. 
two stainless steel jaws shear their way through a sample of peas to determine their actual tenderness. And this is measured by the pointer on the scale. This assures the average consumer of uniformly high quality they can always depend on. On these tables, the peas are inspected so that any foreign material or imperfection can be removed. The peas then receive another washing before being sent on to the actual canning line. In the canning plant, the peas are mixed with carrots and a sugar and salt solution is added for seasoning. This canning machine runs 250 containers a minute. All steps are carefully watched. After the cans are sealed, they are then cooked under processing temperatures. At the freezing line, a special carton folding machine automatically prepares the containers. In the merry-go-round filler, the prepared cartons are filled with frozen, uncooked peas. When they were first frozen, they were in 10-pound cans. Now they're in 10-ounce packages. After being filled, the cartons are checked and weighed before being finally closed. Machines wrap and seal the cartons in a wax paper overlay. These packages are placed in cases and stored in zero coal storehouse warehouses until going out to dealers everywhere. Of course, the proof of any product like this is in the eating. Each morning, samples are brought into the quality control laboratory, cooked just as though at home, and then tasted for flavor. It's another of the steps to ensure quality. The cooked peas are then served to an experienced taster like Lloyd Sankey, who tests over 100 samples daily. It's most certainly an unusual job, but one that is vital in this type of production. Mrs. C.J. Meister, the home economist, prepares for an important executive luncheon at the plant in the afternoon. The executives of our company most certainly enjoy eating their own products and they discuss the various operations within the plant. At this meeting is Mrs. Wentworth, wife of the president and secretary of the company. Mr. T. A. Fremming, sales manager. Mr. C. J. Meister, executive vice president. And Dr. Eichelberg, production manager. And Mr. H. E. Bleasy, raw product supervisor, meet here every day to discuss how they can better the quality of the company's products. The presence of such large-scale farming as is found in the Fairmont area means the presence of an airplane crop spraying and dusting service. Lloyd Allsworth runs the Fairmont Flying Service, which over a year's time sprays approximately four to 5,000 acres. This method of aerial spraying first began with dusting experiments in the south, and through the years, spraying has gradually become more and more popular. Crops are sprayed for control of insects such as tent caterpillar, pea aphid, and corn borer. It is also used as a defoliant and for weed control. Actually, actually, Lloyd does many other things than just spraying. He owns eight ships and does highline patrol work, runs an approved school for flying instruction, and does charter flying and maintenance and repair work on other planes. He began spraying in this area in 1947 and during the war trained cadets for the Navy and Army. Lloyd began flying as a hobby way back in 1931. But this is one case where a hobby has paid off handsomely. This idea of spraying has so caught on that many of the farmers around our town think of aeroplanes as farm implements and always call on Lloyd when a problem arises. The Fairmont Airfield was begun in 1948 as a municipal field. Today, it is, there is a discussion of extending the runway and surfacing in preparation for commercial airline service to our town. This is another in the steps of building and construction, not just for a few, but for all the people of Fairmont and their children. It will mean added convenience and pleasure, and that's what we want for our town. This is the way Fairmont has grown, little by little through the years until now. We are all proud and respect our town. Back in town again, we see another important part of the Fairmont community. The Martin County National Bank. 
It was first organized as a private bank in 1875. Then, a number of years later, the controlling interest was acquired by A.L. Ward, who moved to Minnesota in 1864. The bank then became a state bank, and in 1900, it was converted to its present status. Mr. Ward also had controlling interests in various other banks in Martin County, acquired holdings on farmlands, which he operated on a share basis, and owned and edited a newspaper in Fairmont. Mr. Holden, our bank's cashier, is transacting some business with a depositor. The bank has among its depositors both farmers and businessmen. Its loaning facilities are available for farming, all types of business, and of course, industry. This bank, as the others in Fairmont, weathered the depression of the 1930s and was able to reopen and continue business shortly after it was over. Many of the Martin County Bank's previous customers, mainly farmers and businessmen, who have obtained loans are now owners of their land or business. Peter Ruffridge has had dealings with the bank over years, and they are close friends. This is the way the bank operates, as a friend. These cattle are typical of the Ruffridge farm and all the farmers who have dealt with the Martin County National Bank. One of the men who is among the most important in farming today is the county agent. In our town, the Martin County agent is Joe Clifford. He has come to the Bark Farm to talk with them and to check on how things are going this year. Mr. Clifford was graduated from the University of Minnesota College of Agriculture in 1950. He began teaching in the Veterans Agriculture Department at Sherburne, Minnesota, and then came to our town as county agent. In his job, he gets out and actually talks with the farmers. The federal government, in cooperation with the state and local governments, maintains county extension departments throughout the state. The function of the extension agents is to serve as a connecting link between the experimental stations on a state level and the local farmer on a county level. The county agent helps out with problems of livestock, general farming, and soil management, in addition to special counseling. Martin County, situated near the center of the Corn Belt, enjoys the real distinction of being one of the leading corn, beef, and swine producing counties of Minnesota. Extensive dairying and poultry raising is practically all through this area. The soil of the territory is of a high lime content, rich in black loam and clay subsoil, making it adaptable to the growth of all crops in this latitude. The farmers of Martin County practice sound soil conservation practices in preserving and maintaining their rich productive soil. A special soil conservation district has been organized to provide technical assistance in doing this job. Our farmers have always been among the first to adopt new progressive methods of farming. A county crop improvement association assists in securing the best available varieties of seed. It promotes the production of better crops through the use of demonstration plots. Farmers have quickly adopted these better practices and the average yield of corn, our chief crop today, is around 60 bushels per acre. Dairymen, too, through the Dairy Herd Improvement Associations, are making rapid strides in improving the milk production of their herds. But it does not stop here. A Livestock Improvement Committee carries on an active program for the betterment of all classes and breeds of animals. Yes, great changes have taken place in Martin County since the first harvests of 1856. There were no prepared fields, just primitive, tough prairie sod. It was difficult to grow much on the newly broken fields. In fact, there was no commercial crop at all. The settlers produced for their own needs only. But slowly the change came, and with the change came prosperity and good living. Today, Martin County is famous as one of the greatest corn-growing counties in the United States. It's a real tribute to the ingenuity and progressiveness of our own farmers. When the early settlers arrived in this part of the country, there were almost no trees at all, but gradually trees were seeded and grown. 
On the Bark Farm, we see many beautiful examples of the trees he has planted, developed, and grown. Mr. Bark has 50 to 75 varieties of trees and shrubs growing on his farm, most of them planted when he began farming here in 1919. They have added much to the beauty of his home. The Blue Lakes Game Farm is an interesting example of another of the farming traditions of the Fairmont area. The farm owned by Mr. T.A. Fremming of the Fairmont Canning Company. Mr. Oliver Johnson, the manager of the game farm, is currently raising chucker partridges. These birds will be dressed and shipped out, generally to clubs and fine restaurants. There are presently 258 small partridges. Last year there were 1,200 hens and egg production was up 970 eggs in one day. Fairmont's chick hatcheries contribute to the agricultural production of the area by hatching and marketing some 2,500,000 baby chicks per year. These chicks are shipped to all parts of the upper Midwest. The local trade area purchases approximately 1,500,000 chicks annually for farm flock replacement. Special industries like the Fairmount Cast Stone Company satisfy the tremendous building and construction program of our town. In 1918, Mr. Andrew Gratty began making blocks for construction work in the Fairmont area. After the Second World War, he began a ready-mix concrete service. Now the Fairmont Cast Stone Company makes concrete building blocks during the winter and concentrates on the job of supplying fresh, ready-mix concrete wherever it is needed during the building weather. Here we see a lift stacking the concrete blocks. Besides the manufacture of concrete blocks and the delivery of mixed concrete, the Fairmont Cast Stone Company does some paving on sidewalks, driveways, and many other details that concern the home builder. The actual mixing of concrete begins as the giant crane takes a pile of aggregate and deposits it on a conveyor hopper. The conveyor belt carries the material on up to the aggregate bins, from which it will be loaded into a waiting truck below. After the correct amount of water and aggregate has been loaded into the truck, it drives to the bulk cement bins where the necessary amount of cement is added. Actually, this mixing process is a very delicate and technical matter, and Mr. Gratty, through years of experience, knows when the right amount has been added. The company is a very needed part of our town's industry. Both home and industrial construction rely heavily on cement and ready-mixed concrete because it is a convenient and economical way for builders and contractors to assure themselves of correctly made, high-quality cement needed on the job. Here the Fairmont cast stone trucks are pouring cement for the foundations of a new canning company freezer plant. The company maintains enough trucks to handle a job of any size all the way from huge industrial construction to small family driveways. They're not too big, but they're not too little. In every endeavor, they try to give a really personalized service. Our community likes to work, but they also like to relax. One of their favorite ways of relaxing is playing a round of golf at the Interlochen Golf Club. It had its beginning as the Golf and Boat Club in about 1918. It was reincorporated around 1930 as the Interlochen Golf Club, with today an outstanding membership of 250, with 150 stockholders. The beautiful rolling fairways and bent grass greens make golfing here a superb pleasure. People come from all around this area to play here. It's located one and a half miles south of Fairmont. A full-time professional and manager are always on hand to assist members wishing lesson and also to accommodate visitors. Civic and fraternal organizations provide other types of recreation for our people. For the young people of our town, tennis is an exhilarating sport. These girls are playing on the courts adjoining the high school. The four concrete tennis courts, which the Board of Education maintains, are available for use to the public 
as well as the students. All the various recreational opportunities found in our town make Fairmount not only a pleasant place for the citizens, but especially desirable as a vacation spot. The many visitors to our town can enjoy the parks, swimming, picnicking, golf, boating, fishing, hunting, and many, many other activities, one of which is sure to please. For those who like to go to the movies, there are two modern theaters here. The combined seating is over 1,600. For those who wish an evening out on the town, Fairmont has many wonderful and famous steak and seafood houses, some with dance floors and fine entertainment. All in all, you can find just about anything you want in our town. The many natural beauties of this Minnesota country are, of course, a certain part of the appeal of our town as a good place to the visiting vacationer. Fairmont's fine lakes provide an almost constant source of pleasure. Fishing is excellent in our area. And for the enthusiast, there is a real challenge provided by the many different types of fish that abound in the lakes. But the lakes offer something more than just fishing. Motorboating, too, is a very popular sport during the summer months. These many recreational activities help make Fairmont an outstanding, comfortable place in which to live. And more and more of the people who regularly visit our town are finding this out. Many of them move here for permanent residence because of these visits. But population isn't the only thing that is growing. As Fairmont's expanding industry capacity becomes even more widely known, there are more opportunities for workers here in good jobs. And our town's civic and cultural growth is continually growing too. Our schools, libraries, and churches will undoubtedly expand to meet their growing needs. It will be their job to educate the young citizens of Fairmont, to teach them the history of our great country and the early pioneers who founded towns such as ours. And it is and will continue to be the job of the churches to teach our youngsters the spiritual value of life, a fundamental upon which the successfulness of Fairmont has been built. Ours is a clean, normal, healthy way of life. The people of Fairmont like to get out of doors under the bright sun. They like to fish and to hunt. The people here have a real zest for living. This zest is the keynote of our tremendous progress. Here the people work hard, not for just themselves, but their children and their community. True, we have an industrious town, but it's a beautiful place in which to live as well the kind of beauty that comes with sincere, honest, and friendly people. We hope you've enjoyed this trip, and we extend to you all an invitation to visit us here in Fairmount, Minnesota, USA. This is our town.
My grandmother never called a holiday at the end of May. Not a holiday, but an important day in our calendar. She never called it Memorial Day. She always called it Decoration Day. Do you remember that? It was actually ideated in the South by widows of Confederate soldiers, and it spread to the North, and it was always the last weekend in May. We would like to do a song called Decoration Day and also accompany the song with some film in Fairmont, Minnesota in 1941. Shined and off to the war. In the sad and lifted air we see, true and too sad to say, for some the home is coming, for some the going goes one way. As long as there is a sight, we wave and wave and wave. The train pulls out from the depot. Camera makes us brave. The train pulls out from the driveways. The plane flies from the fields. For some, the home is coming. For some, the going goes one way. And the flower speaks for the shore. comes the parade, bouquets laid today fresh on the graves at the beautiful end of May, Decoration Day, and the flower speaks for the show. Comes the parade, bouquets laid today, fresh on the graves at the beautiful end of May. Decoration. Decoration Day. Did any of you recognize anybody in that film? In 1941, boarding the train to go to World War II? Just thoughts. 
some of you might hear, discovered that film only about a month ago, and that movie opened up that song to me. Incredible, just incredible. Welcome back to Hometown Focus. Well, we looked ahead the last segment. This time we're going to take a look back. Back to 1954, actually. This was a film that was located by uh, the Fairmont City Council. I mean, Jim Smith brought it down to the Martin County Historical Society. It was a promotional movie that was created for the city of Fairmont. has a lot of interesting things as we take a look back this week with Len Tweeden in our Look Back segment. This is Lenny Tweeden at the Martin County Historical Society. About two months ago, Jim Smith, city councilman, brought us a movie. Actually, it's in two segments, and they're each about 26 minutes long. Uh, it appears that it was a promotional movie made of Fairmont, Minnesota, back in the early 1950s. Um, it talks about Fairmont and its population being 8,500 people, uh, its five suburbs, that it was an economically sound area. Uh, they make reference to uh, the fact that it was uh, a center for vacationists is a word that was used by car, bus, and railroad. Um, after we received the, the uh, movie, I contacted John Larson, and he put it on video. And uh, John, I'd like to ask you now, just give a little background on, on what you did regarding that. Well, I just happened to stop down to the museum, I guess, uh, just a day or so after uh, Jim Smith had brought the tape in, mm -hmm. and um, um, took it home and ran it through the, the machine, and. Um, was just very uh, delighted to find that uh, this is a documentary um, of the city of Fairmont made about 1954. And uh, uh, the person that uh, did the documentary, his name was Robert M. Carson. And there's not much known about uh, Robert M. Carson, but I did go on the internet and uh, find some information on him. And uh, he had done some other um, documentaries um, of different towns, but the only two that were known uh, that he had done were of Beatrice, Nebraska, and Syracuse, Nebraska. So I think we've got we've got the third one here, and the, and there probably were other ones. But uh, uh, but when I did see the uh, the tape or the the movie, um, I knew that it was something that we needed to get uh, copied in a professional way. And and I did take it to Sioux City, Iowa, and had the tape uh, digitally um, uh, copied, and. Uh, um, I think it came out very well. It's a very clear picture and uh, no flickering or anything like that. So I think uh, Fairmont has a real treasure here. Uh, it's a, it's a, a view of Fairmont and uh, a lot of different segments of Fairmont from 50 years ago. And I think uh, the, the city is very lucky to have this. Right, I'd agree with you, John. I think it's very, very interesting. Uh, it's interesting to, to look back at uh, seeing some of the sites of Fairmont and comparing it to what they look like now, especially, I think, uh, looking at the houses and the streets, there weren't a lot of trees. Um, one of the interesting segments, or there's quite a few interesting segments, but one uh, near the beginning shows uh, uh, the Amico station right now. It was a standard station. It's seen from uh, Brian's Pharmacy. The intersections of highways 15 and 16 at the edge of town have a constant flow of cars and trucks entering, leaving, or passing through Fairmont. Uh, there's a segment showing the mayor and the city council, Mayor Cam Brown. Uh, I believe the other people there are James McNerney and Knud Peterson. Fairmont operates under the mayor and council form of government. An alderman represents each of the city's various wards, in addition to an alderman at large, who is chosen at the biennial elections. The mayor appoints, subject to the approval of the council, committees on finance, library, and also various others. All of these men work together, along with the citizens of Fairmont, to keep our town a clean and well-managed city. There's a segment on the uh, police chief, George Cavers. Um, shows him uh, kind of in action, actually, right at uh, the police station, receiving a phone call, and it refers to their radio-controlled cars. Uh, the policemen are out at the shooting range. An important part of the police department's activities is a visit to their pistol range. Every week they shoot here and, in addition, attend other pistol matches throughout the state. In fact, our department even has a specially trained match team. 
This team is made up of four men who get the highest score in these practice matches here. And John, uh, what are some of the things that you saw in the movie that you thought were interesting? Well, uh, there were just uh, many, there were so many different interesting aspects in there. I, probably one of the neater ones I thought uh, that I saw was uh, uh, it showed uh, Lloyd Allsworth uh, loading up his biplane with uh, spray chemical. And he, would, he did a lot of spraying for the, uh, the canning factory. And uh, it shows uh, the camera when it was out there, you know, taping uh, uh, with, with 16 millimeter movie. Uh, taping this and uh, it shows Lloyd taking off and then making several passes you know dumping chemical on the on the uh, crops and then uh, the next picture shows the uh, uh, this Robert M. Carson uh, taping Lloyd Allsworth from another plane in other words Robert Carlson was in another plane looking down on uh, Lloyd Allsworth spring this is the way Fairmont has grown little by little through the years until now we are all proud and respect our town. There's, there's shots of the uh, 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 train buffs. So we had you know, trains coming through Fairmont uh, regularly back then, and there's a, quite an interesting shot of the train coming into the station. Each year, visitors and prospective new settlers come to our town by car, bus, and railroad. Since the year 1878, when the railroad first came to Fairmont, it has enjoyed a steady and prosperous growth. In fact, Every census for the past 30 years has shown about a 20% increase in population. The trains bring these visitors to our town of homes, schools, factories, business, and perhaps most important, churches. A town economically sound. Yes, Fairmont faces a bright future. Ample water, cheap and abundant power, and ever-growing industrial and agricultural fields all point the way to this. Another interesting segment, uh, there's a segment of probably about uh, maybe three or four minutes of the uh, Fairmont Martins baseball game. There's an actual baseball game where this guy was out on the field. And Both young and old enjoy the many and varied opportunities for relaxation and fun. After the day's work is over, the people of our town come out to watch their team, the Fairmont Martins, play night ball in competition with other towns in the regional league. The Martins play a full schedule in the Western Minnesota League with night home games played at Martin Park. It's always fun to come out and have a hot dog, outguess the managers, boo the umpires, and root the home team through to another victory. And that's what the people of our town do. They work and work hard, but they also like to relax. And Fairmont offers an interesting and wide variety of recreational facilities to not only its citizens, but also to visitors. And we haven't identified a lot of the Martin players, but that's kind of the uh, interesting part of this whole uh, find here is uh, looking through these, uh, these films again and sitting down with uh, people that uh, probably are still living now and um, having them identify themselves. Right, I know that same clip, it shows a lot of people in the stands, you know, it has some, some uh, fairly lengthy shots of people in the stands and both on the field too. And I think uh, a number of people, as John said, would still be living and maybe your mother or father or somebody is out there too. Um, one clip that I saw that was interesting too, it showed uh, Dick Shear, the municipal band, and he was directing it, 35 adults and 40 students. And they had mentioned it had been in existence for about three years at that time. Uh, another one showed the bus depot. That's where the present uh, uh, municipal liquor store is. And it shows a bus pulling out of the, the bus depot. And they make reference to the Fairmont, the modern Fairmont Community Hospital that employed 60 people compared to today, what, about 600 people? Yes. <laughs> so quite a few changes over the years. Um, one that I wasn't familiar with at all was, uh, was totally new to me, is a Blue Lanes game farm. And partridges were dressed and as uh, stated in the in the movie uh sent to fine restaurants so i thought that was kind of interesting uh, regarding that john any others you can think of uh well well just uh, uh one of the other interesting ones was the um uh the park department trimming trees mm -hmm. uh, they had their uh their their truck with a very rickety ladder on it <laughs> and uh one of the workers uh, climbed up with a, um, a regular carpenter saw and was sawing uh, branches off uh, the trees, you know, down the uh, the sides of the streets, and grabbing the branch and dropping it over the side. Mm -hmm. And uh, another one showed him uh, spraying the ditches 
2,4-D? The 2,4-D, yeah. <clears throat> the worker was there spraying and he didn't have any mask on and and uh, he was just spraying this stuff all over the place. So uh, sure. things have changed. Things have changed, yeah. no doubt. Well, they made reference to several of the banks uh, in town at that time. They referred to Fairmont National Bank and they indicated at that time it was the county's largest bank employing 19 people. Um, some of the people that were shown there, uh, John Teasling, our own Muriel Maliette, who works here at the museum, she's shown in that uh, shot. It also shows the Fairmont Building and Loan Association. Uh, Martin Schomber is meeting with Mr. and Mrs. Ed Hyde. They're apparently considering purchasing a house. And then they leave the building and they uh, go out and uh, drive through town and pull up to one of the houses, apparently one that they might be considering. Along with the rapid growth that has come, the past years have seen intensified efforts to safeguard the savings of the association's members. In 1952, 32% of the earnings were allocated to reserves. There are 3,500 savers and stockholders who are proud members of the association. Talks about railway motors, and one thing I guess I wasn't uh, aware of was the fact that uh, at one time Duluth had made an offer to move railway motors to that city, but uh, of course they didn't go. Products have increased too, and include now 17 different models of motor cars. Then, models of push cars and 30 separate units of work equipment. These products are sold to practically every railroad in the United States and Canada, in addition to being exported to Mexico, Central and South America, Africa, Asia, and to parts of Europe. At present, the company employs around 400 people. It maintains district offices in four other cities, with the central office, of course, in our town. Again, I, uh, this is, uh, I think this is a real uh, a wonderful find, a real gem for the city of Fairmont. And um, um, if you can maybe comment a little on, the, you know, if this is going to be something that we can uh, show here. I, I know a lot of people won't want to see this. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a definite possibility. Um, one thing I'll mention, we are going to have the video for sale here at the museum. If you're interested, you can call the museum and uh, we'll put you down for a video. The cost is going to be $20 plus sales tax. It'll be a total of $21.30. Uh, on the video will be the Our Town production. We'll also have uh, the 1934 corn husking contest on it. Uh, the World War II soldiers marching down, I believe it was First Street. And there's also uh, a milking contest that will be on there. That's uh, done in front of the Strand, uh, which became the Lake Theater in downtown Fairmont. And I guess if there's enough interest, why well, would you certainly consider a showing or maybe several showings here at the museum or some other venue, depending upon what we can uh, uh, work out but uh, they will be for sale here at the museum, so if you're interested, give us a call. John, anything else? I guess uh, finding this um, makes, makes one wonder how many other old movie films like this might be around laying in people's uh, attics or closets, and uh, I guess if, uh, you know, if people do have uh, those types of things, which uh, I know personally, I started taking movies back in high school, and, sure. and uh, I know a lot of people um, have uh, movies, uh, one, one individual, uh, Ted and Opal Kittleson, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, have uh, uh, just a wealth of family uh, uh, um, movies that, that they've taken. I mean, they've got all kinds of roles that we've been converting for them. I think if people have these, uh, these historic uh, movies, it might be something that the museum would be interested in, in uh, taking a look at, because there, there could very well be some very historic uh, shots around town here of people, uh, you know, that people have taken over the years, and uh, they don't have projectors. Most people don't have movie sure. projectors anymore, but uh, I know the uh, the museum has accepted a number mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, quite interesting movies. Uh, you, uh, you have a, quite a good collection of the uh, Centennial movies. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Blaine, but um, uh, what was the fellow's name there? Yeah. Uh, a fellow from uh, from town here took a lot of uh, movies. Uh, Blaine Gukin mm -hmm. uh, and has a lot of movies of the uh, centennial parades of all the small towns around Fairmont. Sure. So uh, I guess uh, if it's okay with you, if people you know have some of these and want to bring them in and see what's on them, sure, it'd be a good way to keep a record. Um, and again, I'll mention I think this is a, a real a real find, a real gem of local history. So if you're interested. Please contact us, and we certainly appreciate the fact that Jim Smith from the City Council brought it down to the museum. This is Lenny Tweeten for Hometown Focus.